I will uh, now introduce my colleague, Michelle Schulzberg. Uh, Michelle is well known to this group. She is a uh, uh, hematologist at St. Michael's Hospital. Uh, she did her, uh, under, her medical training and uh, undergraduate training at McGill, then came to Toronto for a research uh, fellowship in uh, hemostasis. Uh, she's a clinical hematologist who's focused on bleeding and is the medical uh, director of the Hematology Ontology Clinical Research Group. She is also director of the uh, Coagulation Laboratory at St. Michael's and co-director of the Hemophilia Centre. She's involved in a number of studies, uh, presently uh, the study of predictive tools for perioperative bleeding appropriate and appropriateness of coagulation testing, uh, new, treats for, new treatments for immune thrombocytopenia, and novel approaches for care of women with inherited bleeding disorders. Thank you, and thank you to our two co-chairs, Dr. Winnikoff and Pam Wilton, for inviting me. It is a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to present on iron deficiency anemia in pregnancy. Here are my disclosures. There are actually not, no financial disclosures that are relevant to this talk, but I definitely have um, emotional, intellectual uh, disclosures and conflicts of interest, to be honest. Um, so I'm going to review the role of iron in the body, review the states of increased iron demand but the, the focus on pregnancy, review the consequences of iron deficiency in pregnancy, and review a new approach to treatment. So iron is essential for many things, not just red blood cell production. Um, it's important for DNA synthesis, including hemoglobin synthesis, efficient energy utilization, and it's also a requirement for the metabolism of nearly every single cell in a mammal's body. What are our bodily requirements? So we use about one milligram of elemental iron daily, and we absorb in our proximal duodenum about one to two milligrams daily. Um, with menstruation, we lose about two milligrams of elemental iron daily. And in states of iron deficiency and in pregnancy, we can actually increase our absorptive capacity up to five milligrams daily. What's really important is that there are a bunch of regulators for iron um, homeostasis, and a key, key hormone is called hepcidin. And hepcidin uh, acts as an inhibitor to iron absorption and effective iron utilization. So when its levels are up, um, it actually interferes with the utilization of iron, and it'll become relevant later. So the states of increased iron demand are in infancy and in adolescence when we're growing at rapid rates, uh, menstruation, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. And so menstruation, pregnancy, and breastfeeding are three states that are unique to women. So what is the story of iron debt in women? So we lose, I said, two milligrams of elemental iron with regular menstrual bleeding daily. And if we assume that we are uh, bleeding for seven days, um, then that means that a woman is losing 14 milligrams daily. Now, of course, that number can go up substantially if a woman is experiencing heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, from the genesis of the baby all the way to after delivery, when every woman naturally bleeds postpartum, it takes just over a gram of iron for that entire process to occur. That's a lot of iron. So how do we diagnose iron deficiency? Typically, as Paula mentioned earlier, with ferritin, a very simple, cheap laboratory test. And in the absence of inflammation, ferritin is in fact the most sensitive marker of iron deficiency. So in the presence of inflammation, iron actually goes up as it can acute phase reactant. The WHO suggests a ferritin of less than 15 as an indicator of iron deficiency. Um, I actually disagree with that less than 15. That's for sure in keeping with severe iron deficiency, but we generally say that a ferritin of less than 30 is diagnostic of iron deficiency. It has a very high sensitivity and appropriate specificity. So the definition of anemia is population dependent. In men, we say that a man is anemic if his hemoglobin is less than 130. For a non-pregnant woman, less than 120. And for a pregnant woman, less than 110. And so that takes into account hemodilution that occurs in pregnancy. So why is iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia important? So we know that it impacts cardiovascular health, energy, cognition, health-related quality of life, as Sue Robinson was describing earlier. 
and we know that its effects on energy, cognition, and quality of life are independent of the hemoglobin level. So just being iron deficient and not anemic affects all of those important things. And we also know that iron supplementation results in a significant improvement in all of these variables. In fact, um, a meta-analysis of 14 randomized controlled trials showed that there was an improvement in attention and concentration, two critical elements that contribute to our IQ, with iron supplementation in iron deficient women. So obviously this is important for a woman's self-esteem, for her empowerment, for her ability to achieve. If your IQ is lower, you're not gonna go very far. So what about in pregnancy? So what are the unique impacts of iron deficiency on a woman when she's pregnant? Well, of course, significant fatigue, diminished cardiovascular reserve, which can worsen the shortness of breath that naturally occurs in pregnancy, diminished cognitive function. I'm sure many of you have heard of mommy brain. Uh, decreased health-related quality of life in pregnancy and postpartum. Postpartum depression. And of course, risk of red blood cell transfusion. And what about the risks for the baby? So premature delivery, small for gestational age, the need for an NICU admission, delayed motor maturity, childhood anemia, and even problems with memory and learning that extend all the way into childhood years. So this is not a problem that just affects the baby at birth. This is a study that looked at um, whether intravenous iron versus oral iron in women who had experienced postpartum hemorrhage uh, resulted in important changes in fatigue and postnatal depression. And we found that if we were more aggressive, i.e. treating women with intravenous iron, that there was a substantial decrease in fatigue and the risk of postpartum depression. So we need to be aggressive in the management of iron deficiency. So iron deficiency is the most prevalent nutritional deficiency in the world, and it's the only nutrient deficiency that is also highly prevalent in industrialized countries. In fact, the worldwide prevalence of iron deficiency anemia in non-pregnant women is about 30%, and in pregnant women, about 40%. So that's really high. So this is sort of like epidemic scale proportions. But what about in the developed world? So this is uh, a study that looked at about 8,000 deliveries in an American tertiary care maternity hospital from 2015 to 2016. And it showed that about 20% of the women in the developed tertiary care setting had anemia. What about our patients though? So we know that iron deficiency in our patients is common, but there are in fact very few studies that have assessed the risk or prevalence of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia amongst women with inherited bleeding disorders. We presume, and we know anecdotally, that they're both highly prevalent, especially in women of childbearing age. And we know that this must occur predominantly on the basis of heavy menstrual bleeding. Studies you know, approximate anywhere between 84 to 90% of women with VWD have heavy menstrual bleeding. In a study of adolescent women with heavy menstrual bleeding, 87.5% had a ferritin of less than 40, so were iron deficient, and about 30% had severe iron deficiency. And if we translate that into pregnancy, I can say at least anecdotally, but there's never been a study that has looked at this, that every single pregnant woman with an inherited bleeding disorder that I see in my clinic is iron deficient. So the risk factors for iron deficiency anemia include race, poverty, Lower education, low iron intake, heavy menses, parity, i.e. how many times you've been pregnant, and obesity. And so that means that individuals of lower socioeconomic status are at higher risk because of their low dietary intake of iron, because iron-rich foods are very expensive, and also because they have limited access to health care, because generally individuals who are um, have, of higher socioeconomic status recognize the need to uh, be seen by a physician and also can advocate better for themselves. So that means that those that are most prone to iron deficiency are also the least likely to be tested and treated. So it's a health equity issue. But is iron deficiency anemia a public health or a social justice issue? So if you look at these two graphs, so the first side shows um, low income regions and the prevalence of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. And the green bar is iron deficiency anemia. Um, and this is highly prevalent in regions of low income. And then the graphic on the right um, shows 
that the green patch also overlaps with reproductive age. So there's this enormous swatch of preventable anemia, that entire green swatch, if you unstrap and treat the entire green band. And iron deficiency anemia in women of reproductive age, whether they have an inherited bleeding disorder or not, of not, is totally out of control. So this is a public health issue. So what do our guidelines say? Um, so what do they say in response to this enormous public health concern? Well, unfortunately, um, there's not a lot of good evidence in the area, and so that leads to not only heterogeneity in practice, but also heterogeneity in variability and, in fact, vagueness of the guidelines that exist. So our Canadian OB guidelines recommend measuring a hemoglobin and ferritin, but with, in fact, no specific guidelines as to when that should occur. And they recommend in second and third trimester that about 27 milligrams of elemental iron daily should be, should be um, taken by the woman. But that's actually really hard to cover by diet alone, and they make no recommendations. The American guidelines, so this is from the US Preventative Services Task Force, they found insufficient evidence to balance the benefits and harms of screening pregnant women for iron deficiency to prevent adverse maternal and birth outcomes, despite everything that I've told you. What about the guidelines from the UK and Australia? They recommend screening pregnant women with a hemoglobin measurement and oral iron supplementation if anemia is identified. Highly vague and not helpful for obstetricians or family practice teams or midwives where you know, hematology is not what they're comfortable dealing with. And so sort of in response to this, all prenatal supplements include somewhere between 10 and 30 milligrams of elemental iron. But there's a problem with the prenatal supplements that I'll get to later. So I've told you already that iron deficiency anemia is really common in the developed world as well. But what about red blood cell transfusion? So that same study found that about 1% of women received a postpartum red blood cell transfusion. So our rates of transfusions in the industrialized world is actually low, and this is similar to the rate at our hospital. But 1% is still too much, because why should we avoid transfusions in women of reproductive age? Well, specifically, we are concerned about the risk of red blood cell alloimmunization, and then subsequent risk of hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn in future pregnancies. And we know that the best and safest transfusion is the one that's never given. So it's critical to treat iron deficiency anemia with iron, and not with a transfusion if we can avoid it. But what about iron availability? So elemental iron, unfortunately, has really limited bioavailability. It is available in meat and leafy greens, but um, we absorb iron from a heme-based source from meat far better than we do from a uh, plant-based source. So we are rigged to be carnivores. And so what are the ways that we can improve iron absorption? Well, we should avoid co-ingestion co of iron supplements with foods that are heavy in calcium, phytates, which are in cereals, and tannins, so what's in coffee and tea. And prenatal vitamins are, also include calcium. And so the calcium that exists within the prenatal vitamin is surely interfering with the absorption of the small amount of elemental iron that's in the tablet. It's also important to separate the medications from, um, from medications that interfere with iron absorption, such as proton pump inhibitors and Tums and all that kind of stuff. And ascorbic acid, so vitamin C that's found in citrus fruits, actually enhances iron absorption. So there are generally three forms of oral iron supplements. Uh, there are the iron salts, so ferrous gluconate, ferrous sulfate, and ferrous fumarate. Ferrous sulfate is actually the best study, and it appears to be superior to the polysaccharide irons in a pediatric study. The iron polysaccharide complexes also exist. They maybe are better tolerated, but we actually have really crummy evidence there. And then there are the heme-based iron that come from animal sources, and so that's proferrin, optifer. Uh, they might be better tolerated, but again, we don't really know that for certain. Proper dosing and frequency. So typically we recommend a daily dose of elemental iron in somebody who's iron deficient, have somewhere between 50 and 150 milligrams of elemental iron daily. Um, but we have some emerging evidence that giving less oral iron daily might com provide comparable treatment to higher dosing. And in fact, there's an emerging body of evidence to support alternate day dosing to maximize absorption, because that actually may drop pepsidin levels and result in enhanced iron absorption. 
We also have intravenous options, and we should consider this when oral iron is either poorly absorbed or poorly tolerated, and if the patient is having ongoing significant blood loss or if the patient is experiencing severe anemia. So in response to all of that information that I just presented to you, at St. Mike's we developed a quality improvement project to address iron deficiency anemia in our obstetric patient population. And we call that the Iron Mom. And a good friend of mine developed this logo that we love. <laughs> so I thought that um, it might be interesting for me to give you all the pitch that we gave to something called the Angel's Den. The Angel's Den is a new research competition at St. Mike's, and they make the Angel's Den like Dragon's Den. And um, so you have five minutes to present your pitch, and it's, it's supposed to be sort of a TED Talk style, just with the slides, no words on the slide. And um, we actually pitched it to three real dragons. Um, so they had the real dragons there, which was a bit intimidating. And there was an audience of about 500 people that were there. And so I'm gonna give you the pitch, and so we were asking for money for support from the dragons. So before I tell you about anemia, I need to teach you a little bit about red blood cells. So red blood cells deliver oxygen to the vital organs in our body. And you can think of it like a delivery truck. And the flatbed of that truck is iron. It holds the oxygen into place. And when we don't have enough iron, we don't have enough red blood cells. And when we don't have enough red blood cells, we call that anemia. But anemia isn't just about being tired. For moms, iron deficiency can lead to crippling fatigue, difficulty concentrating, shortness of breath, needing a blood transfusion at the time of delivery, and postpartum depression. For babies, it can be even worse. It can lead to low birth weight, premature delivery, long-term learning problems, poor future academic performance, and even early death. It takes a lot of iron to make a baby and to make the extra blood that a woman needs to sustain her pregnancy. And by a lot of iron, I mean 177 large stakes. So it's no wonder that iron deficiency in pregnancy is so common. Now up to 50% of pregnant women have iron deficiency, but we didn't believe it. We said there's no way at St. Michael's Hospital, a tertiary care center, there's no way that that many women are actually iron deficient in pregnancy. So we looked and fully 30% of pregnant women at delivery at St. Michael's Hospital were not just iron deficient, but we're anemic. So why is this happening? Iron deficiency is easy to diagnose and it's relatively easy to treat, but it's happening. It's not happening, not at St. Michael's, not at Mount Sinai, not at Humber River, not at Sunnybrook. Why? That's because the obstetric teams are focusing on other important things, and also likely because they don't recognize the importance of iron deficiency. So this is where we come in. So addressing iron deficiency isn't as simple as handing out iron pills. It requires a culture change. And the Iron Mom addresses that need. The Iron Mom is a toolkit of educational resources, uh, and testing, and treatment pathways. It makes it easy for clinicians to do the right thing. Importantly, it also empowers future moms by teaching them about iron deficiency and enables them to be advocates for their own health and for the health of their babies. So why do we need your help? So right now the Iron Mom exists at St. Mike's but in paper-based format. I know it's 2018 and we're talking about paper. So we need your help to convert the Iron Mom into a digital format. But in medicine, going digital isn't as simple as developing an app and loading it onto the App Store. We also need your help to test and validate the digital Iron Mom before it is released. Also, 40% of women in Toronto do not speak English or French as their mother tongue. So we also need your help to translate the Iron Mom into three, the three most common languages spoken in Canada. So this is not a women's health issue. This is an issue for all of us, men and women, boys and girls. If we want a productive, whip-smart next generation, then we need to make iron deficiency in pregnancy a thing of the past. And with your help, we can do this. Vote Iron Mom. So we won. Uh, 
So we won the Social Innovation Award, uh, and we were granted $60,000 to make the Iron Mom into a digital tool. And we're working with Troon Technologies, who's helping us do that, so thank you for Paula for introducing us to them. And I'm actually going to Hong Kong in a couple of months to present this again internationally to hopefully get some more money, because it's actually really expensive to make things digital. And this is an important picture. Notice our t-shirts. So we actually developed these t-shirts with the logo, and one of the dragon's uh, den, or the angel's den judges, was Joe Mimran, who's like the owner of Joe Fresh. And one of his comments was, I love your branding. And so this is our entire team. It didn't, it's not just me who developed the Iron Mom, it's a team of wonderful people who made this happen. So here are some of the results of the paper-based toolkit. For the, from the Iron Mom. So this is our ferritin pre and post testing rates. So the, the blue is all of our ferritin testing rates in pregnant women before the Iron Mom, and the red is all the ferritin testing rates post Iron Mom. I don't even need to give you a p-value for this. It's like mind blowing. So when we saw that, we said, wow, that means that we're gonna have an unbelievable treatment effect, right? It's gotta be huge. <laughs> That's what we thought. We also had the opportunity to look at the distribution of ferritins in pregnancy of women at St. Michael's. And we found that 80% were iron deficient. So our primary outcome was the proportion of women who had a hemoglobin over or under 100. Pre-intervention, it's 12.4% under 100. Post-intervention, 10.5%. So we had about a 2% reduction in anemia I, and significant anemia, not just anemia, because less than 110 in pregnancy is anemia. We said 100, though, is probably clinically significant um, in our paper-based toolkit implementation. Our toolkit's not perfect. Um, the compliance with the paper-based toolkit's not great. There's many more things that we can do, and we haven't engaged the mom herself as much as we can with a digital tool. And we think once we engage the patient, this is really gonna make a big difference. So what about our patients again, patients with inherited bleeding disorders? So we know that our patients are predisposed to chronic blood loss and therefore <coughs> iron deficiency and anemia. But the incidence and impact is largely unknown. Um, we know that they're at high risk and we think that the risk is even higher in pregnancy. And it's also possible that iron deficiency, and Rochelle mentioned this earlier, that maybe iron deficiency itself also contributes to bleeding risk in postpartum hemorrhage because we think that iron is actually important for platelet function. And we also know that these women, when pregnant, are at risk for future losses because their risk of postpartum hemorrhage is increased at baseline. So this is just in all women, the leading cause of maternal mortality is postpartum hemorrhage, okay? It accounts for 20% of all maternal deaths and affects one to 3% of births. And in affected women, i.e. women with inherited bleeding disorder, we know that that rate is up by tenfold. And it affects five to 6% of births uh, in von Willebrand disease. This is a study on uh, a qualitative study of postpartum hemorrhage experience or postpartum bleeding experience by uh, Heather Vandermeulen, who's a resident working with me. And I just wanted to say one thing here, and her poster is outside if you want to read more about it, and I'm sure she'd love to chat with you. The themes that we picked up was normalization of bleeding symptoms, lack of education about postpartum hemorrhage, the importance of a bleeding plan, and the symptoms being dismissed by the healthcare team. The key thing is the normalization of bleeding symptoms. If you bled heavily your entire life, you are unlikely to recognize postpartum hemorrhage. So I propose that in patients with inherited bleeding disorder who are at risk, high risk for future iron losses, that our threshold to treat iron deficiency should be lower. Maybe we should target a ferritin of less than 50 or maybe even less than 75 when pregnant. And we think that our treatment targets should be higher, perhaps a ferritin of greater than 100 because they're high risk. We really shouldn't be worried about iron overload. So in conclusion, it's important to educate our patients about excessive vaginal bleeding, heavy menstrual bleeding and postpartum hemorrhage, and the impact of iron deficiency anemia on mother and baby. We should plan for postpartum bleeding and include all healthcare players, including the patient. Screen for abnormal postpartum bleeding, remembering that normal is not necessarily normal. Ask about postpartum mood and energy, and treat iron deficiency early, retreat postpartum, and throughout reproductive years, and we should likely raise our targets. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'd like to thank the amazing team who's worked with me. Thank you. Are there questions, Dr. Schulzberg? 
Um, Gregor Steele from Calgary. Thank you very much, Michelle. That was really interesting. Um, just a comment and a question. One about uh, the Ferramax and the other heme-based irons. And, you know, there really is no evidence out there about these preparations, especially for even just for the symptoms associated with iron deficiency. Yeah. So anecdotally, oftentimes I'll tell patients to switch and their iron indices are normal by the time they come to see me after the referral from the family physician. And in that pediatric study, they also showed no real difference between the symptoms mm -hmm. of, of taking iron in the two groups, taking that, the heme and the regular iron salts. And we know that those formulations are a lot more expensive. So uh, I think it's something we need to learn more about. My other question was about, um, you know, sort of empowering women to have better knowledge of their own results. So, because I find often when I see, um, kids, and I'll ask moms about their history of iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia, they say, yes, I'm iron deficient, and I'll have access to their records. And oftentimes, their report doesn't correlate what I see in uh, you know, lab results. So I'm just wondering, did you find any, did you look at that at all, about women's self-reporting of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia and correlation with her own uh, lab testing? And, and perhaps sharing the results with women would help them you know, advocate for themselves and also, like, make sure that we're accurate in. Yeah, so we didn't look at that in the study, um, but we're, we're planning for a large uh, cluster randomized controlled trial. Uh, we're gonna hopefully enroll 40 to 50 different hospital sites in Ontario and cluster them to either the iron mom <coughs> versus standard of care. Um, and it is one of the, the things that we're gonna be interested in. The key with the digital iron mom is engaging the mom. I couldn't agree more. We think that if a mother arrives to the, her obstetrician's office and said, what was my ferritin? You checked it last time, right? That's gonna be a huge cue. And we think that pregnant women are a really captive audience and we think that compliance rates in pregnancy are unusually higher than any other patient population. And we think that if we make this, ideally, if the cluster RCT actually shows what we think it will show, um, that this will result in a dramatic change in policy and in guidelines. And just like folic acid is so readily taken by all pregnant women, we hope that iron supplements will be as well. Thank you. Do I have time for a quick comment? So first of all, congratulations on a project that I think is absolutely going to be uh, world changing. Uh, I'm convinced and we know that you can get platelet dysfunction from iron deficiency, that's been shown. Um, I'm convinced also that the platelet dysfunction induced by iron deficiency is contributing not only to postpartum hemorrhage, but I'm convinced that it's contributing to menorrhagia. Mm -hmm. And I'll just end by saying that when I was a resident, I was reading Wintrobe uh, to study and I went to my old mentor and I said to him, Dr. Rosenberg, there's a mistake in Wintrobe. And he said to me, how so, Professor Winnikoff? And I said, it says, I remember those words. And I said, it says that um, iron deficiency causes menorrhagia. They got it wrong. It's the other way around. And he said, no, you still have a lot to learn, my dear. And so I think he was 25 or 40 years ahead of this. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've had the same experience. And I know that Paula's had the same experience as well. And I find that... And I've actually been um, quite aggressive with some of the patients where if they can't tolerate oral iron, even if they're not anemic, I treat them with intravenous iron and their menorrhagia improves. Um, yeah. Question, of course. Final question? Um, well, I think we should be giving you a standing ovation actually for this. I think it's so important, so thank you. And uh, I've been saying everything you've been saying for 20 years, but um, it needs to be said in a different way what you're doing. Um, and I, I think it's really important that we collectively look at what's in choosing wisely, um, because right now, um, Choosing Wisely Canada is trying to discourage ferritin testing, uh, especially in people with normal CBCs. In sub, it, it, you know, in small print, it's written if your patient is asymptomatic. But this is another issue: what is asymptomatic, and what are people asking? So there's a huge uh, effort on to do less ferritin testing. And you know, it's, it's a subgroup saying that you know, it's a waste of time in people with normal CVCs. Um, so this is very timely, and, uh, but I, I think we've got to get straight to choosing wisely uh, and get that message across about um, how important um, good 
ferret and uh, iron stores are especially, um, well, in fact, in all sorts of, in all sorts of people. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.